presentation I want to give you today is really to dispel the myths of what design is and how it can actually help a future manufacturing workforce. Many of you have probably actually used design somewhere. Um, but when I talk about design, it's actually not design as a noun, which is an outcome. It's actually the design as a process. And what I've been hearing today, you know, we need a lot of STEM, which is really, really true. And that really underpins any sort of innovation. But we also need a lot of management capability. The difference is where design actually links both of those together. You can't actually have a very educated STEM employed workforce and you can't have strong management capability unless you start to get those two working together. And design is really that bridge. So my presentation today is to really dispel some of those myths and give you some strategies of actually how companies are using design successfully to actually drive their competitiveness. And I suppose in the spirit of the presentation, I'm actually using what designers do. Designers are the days of you know, seeing a designer saying, I think the vision will be blah, standing in their turtleneck jackets or what have you. Isn't really there. What designers do is a whole heap of experiments. And today is just an experiment. And they use this thing called C move C. Donald Sean talked about this in the 60s. I'm going to show you something, and hopefully collectively in the question time we can move upon it, but then to actually see it again in a different way. So what I'm presenting here isn't the answer, but it's actually part of the conversation. So I'm going to start with, I suppose, this proposition from, from industry, Catherine Livingstone. And Catherine actually chairs a group, or actually the patron of a group called the Australian Design Integration Network, who I work with closely. And she gave this presentation last year, and she talks about, in the concept of innovation, Australians are very capable amateurs, but increasingly face sophisticated competition. It's given. We need to get very specific about the role of design and innovation and the role of design thinking. Now, the term design thinking has is, is really been popularised over the last five or six years. And it's really mushroomed in this idea of actually it can do lots of different things for industry. But there's actually a lot of misconceptions about what design thinking is, because design thinking is only part of it. But I use this presentation, or, or this quote, because it's, I would never have thought about this 15 years ago, that we actually had someone like Catherine talking about the role of design to actually drive competitiveness. It's really come full circle. Unfortunately, a lot of the actual stakeholders haven't kept up with it. So, myself, and if I reflect back, looking backwards to look forwards, I've been in the business for about 30 years as, a, as an industrial designer. That's been my background. And when I finished university, I was trained to work into a mass manufacturing workforce to design products for actually, whether it be consumer products, electronics, automotive. And a lot of my colleagues um, um, went in to some very successful jobs. I consulted for a long time. But I was responsible for designing a lot of dumb problems. They were never framed correctly. Okay, I worked in an industry that I knew a long, long time ago wasn't competitive. And what I needed to do was to get to the root cause of that. And what I did was I kept saying, well, why am I getting the wrong brief? Why am I solving the wrong sort of problems? What do I need to do to change? And it really came down to those two fundamentals. One, we actually had companies who actually didn't understand their market at all, didn't understand who their customer was. And secondly, I had managers who were actually being incentivized to actually design things that were efficient, but actually not competitive on a global scale. So I set about over the last 30 years redefining my job. And I've changed my job about five or six times to get to a position now where I'm at UTS in this new center where I actually don't sit in the faculty. I report up to the, uh, into the chancery to actually build this thinking across the university. I think that's the key message here. It is interdisciplinary. Yes, we need silos of excellence, but we also need these people who can link. So obviously, Australia's declining competitiveness. It's been talked about in the popular media, and often it gets talked about in terms of how urine talked about, in terms of we need more um, subsidies, we need more support. And, and the conversation often gets lost um, in, in the popular media saying, well, why do we need to support industries that are struggling? And I think in today, in Euron's presentation in particular, we talked about why it's actually every citizen's problem rather than actually just a particular industry. But our competitiveness is actually more than a few industries dying. And if you look at the um, World um, Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index, it's painted Australia as actually declining over the last three years significantly, going backwards. And we're 21 out of 144 countries. 
But the data's a bit misleading, because the way they rank innovation, they talk about different stages, and we're actually an innovation-driven economy. There's only 40-odd companies in that, or 40-odd countries. And we're actually saying, well, in that, we're actually 21 out of 40, so we're actually not that good. Break it down a bit more, where our biggest challenge is, is our innovation and sophistication factors, which is business sophistication and the level of innovation within that. They're the issues we need to be addressing, rather than some other issues that we actually quite know and we're actually quite good at. So making sure our, our, our organizations and our, our companies are competitive is really been a large part of what I've been doing. And I look at this quote here, that when we talk about innovation or productivity, which drives innovation in advanced economies, it's traditionally been about this innovation embodied in capital equipment. And you're in both and Sweet talked about that. But we know, as we get some structural economic shift, it's also non-technological innovation. And we talked about the soft skills, or the soft sciences around that. Now this includes design, branding, new business models, which, which are all good, and we have a lot of people out there who can do that. But we also need organizations which have the ma management capabilities to enable it. And that's what's missing, time and time again. So, a lot of the research when you start about where design actually takes its first point is this innovation mindset. We need to change the mindset of our management. And um, we heard about a report by Roy Green um, earlier this morning, which is about management matters. This is a study that was done uh, with the London School of Economics creating a whole heap of countries, and it mapped Australia's management performance. Really rigorous data set uh, within it. And it did show that if you break it up into these three different types of management metrics, operations, performance, and then people, Australia is actually okay in operations and performance. They can actually work within that. But where they fail is in this people metrics. And one statistic in particular, which is instilling a, a talent mindset amongst its staff. Okay, how do you actually enable creativity okay, amongst your workforces to actually allow them to actually innovate within it? So even though we're very good at operational efficiency and operational drivers, we're not good at actually getting the best out of our staff within that. And that's a huge barrier that we need to address. So where does design come in? And as I mentioned earlier, most people when they talk about design, they talk about design as a noun, new product development, or the new design of a, a, a website, or a piece of communication, or, or a piece of fashion. And there's a lot of design out there, and we still need actually design activity that actually focus on an artifact. But design is also a process. It's a very formal process. Most people would look at the design process and see it's quite creative or quite random. Designers actually follow a very rigid process and again, it's about very much experimentation uh, within that. So how do you get businesses starting to think like designers? Now this is very different to actually getting businesses to become design thinkers. It's just using these processes that breaks down some of the linear thinking within them. Let me explain. So the term design thinking got popularized about well, five or six years ago by a guy by the name of Tim Brown, but it's been around since the 1920s. And he talks about, well, design thinkers have this Always start with empathy. And Carl talked about you know, Apple didn't, you wouldn't use the word start because they could ever understand who was using their product and had this deep empathy <coughs> with them. They take this people first approach constantly. They very much integrate it. They try to draw in many different threads together. And that's what I liked about this conference. It actually drawing in multiple threads to actually try to um, frame out what are the salient features. Designers are very optimistic. Um, <laughs> They always assume there's one other existing answer, and they keep building upon it. They use experiments constantly to learn from, and we talked about that this morning, and that learning culture is a really critical one, what designers will do, and they're very collaborative. Again, all the qualities we talked about today. Um, so there's been a whole heap of work of actually saying we need to build design thinking qualities inside our management, because we know from the work that Roy Green was doing in other studies, that it doesn't exist. Okay, it's the antithesis. And this fundamentally, so there's been this mushrooming of courses out there of design thinking. Again, this isn't teaching you to be a designer. This is just using processes, which is the antithesis of what you actually get out of an MBA program. So Roger Martin talked about inductive thinking and abductive thinking. In a management program, you will get inductive thinking. 
As a leader, you get rewarded by able to get to the answer first. You actually rationalize your thought process, take out all the variables, and get one right answer. That's what you actually get um, rewarded for. And it's the way most, you know, if you do an MBA, there's only one right answer. Do an analysis, and you get to that answer very fast. Design thinkers do something very differently. They start to reframe problems. And it's abductive. By reframing and constantly drawing out a lot of the contradictions and constraints, or actually making sure they're there, they say there's po possible solutions to this. And it's how your answer is actually framed to the questions you set make it right or wrong. So there's multiple answers. And if we look at a competitive environment in, in, in where most of our organisations are, there's not one right solution to any problem that faces them. There's multiple ones. And how they actually orientate themselves to that make them actually successful or not. So you can start to use these design thinking qualities quite a lot in organisations. This is an interesting study. It was just released by PISA. Uh, 2012, actually ranking creative problem-solving skills um, across uh, with 85,000 students, so 15-year-olds, across 44 OECD countries. Quite a large study. And it, Australia is sitting down here. But what was interesting was it actually looked at, it was just released last week, I think, um, or got picked up some of the reporting of it, about how you actually solve problems. You can be a problem solver by actually using algorithmic views of it, or you can actually start to look at a problem and actually use creative programs or processes to reframe them. Typically we say, you know, um, Asian countries are actually very good at rote learning and can actually understand the formula and can actually solve a problem. And Australia would be slightly different, or, or Western countries. What this study showed was our trading partners are actually, if not better, than what we actually have in our creative problem solving skills. So we've got a lot of work to do. If where we're looking at actually trading and saying, yeah, well, our competitive advantage is actually how we go about approaching problems. This data is actually starting to say at a generational change, this is 15 year olds, we're starting to see some difference. We need to make some changes now. But it's more than thinking. I think this is the key where it often gets lost. You can actually build a lot of thinking qualities inside your management, but then you need to do something with it. Once you've built that capability, how do you innovate slightly differently? So here's a study that was done by the Dublin Group. We've talked about this a few times. It's a, a US-based company. Um, and they talk about where do firms innovate? And we know innovation can be lots of different things. But here they broke it up into three main categories, around the offering level, around the experiential level, or around the configuration level, around your organization. So here would be a, you know, better product and systems. Here is actually, you know, Apple's very much at that end around customer engagement or in brand. And this is actually companies like um, Hilti who changed their business model completely from actually selling capital equipment or selling products to leasing. Or GE, how it actually sells time of engine aircrafts rather than the product itself. In the study they did was they mapped the type of innovation that large companies did over a 10 year time. Majority of this was actually product offering. Not really that unsurprising when you look at an innovation pipeline. You know, most companies say we're going to actually do lots of innovation in a pipeline, and eventually as we go through, we'll get to something. So we see lots of activities happening here, but very few innovations happening in business models or in customer experiences. But again, map that back to value, where value actually got created was actually when you actually generated innovation around your business model or around your customer experience. Those companies that just innovated around their product rarely actually um, paid back the cost of capital in what they were doing. The reason being, here, that's easy to copy. If you only innovate around a product level, lots of screen, screens out there. If you only innovate around the product, it's actually a very easy thing to copy. But if you innovate around your business model, you will fundamentally change your product and service. If you innovate around your customer experience, you'll also fundamentally change your product and service. And those intangibles or non-technological innovations are very hard to copy and actually make you very competitive. So some recent data. This is actually came out uh, last year, Design Management Institute, and they talked about design-centric organisations. And what's interesting about this was, you know, these are large companies. The companies who actually impaired design strategically, design thinking and actually innovate around their business model, will outperform the stock market or S&P by a factor of two to one, constantly, in times of actually recession and in times of growth. 
Now these are quite large companies that you're actually looking in there, but they're also very good at actually how they embed these qualities and allow staff to perform. The way they undertake innovation is very different to what we see in just a, um, in, in most Australian firms, from my experience. Going back to more SMEs, this is work that's done by the UK Design Council. You know, if, um, design will increase turnover. For every one pound spent, you get a 20 pound increase in turnover, or increases in exports, or actually increases in profits. This data's been around for 20 years. In Australia, we don't have this data. We're, sent, we're very much laggards in this. And it's really quite frustrating that you get to part the picture, but we don't go all the way with it. And the fact we don't have any data to support this is quite frustrating in actually seeing some adoption. Now we're seeing some pilots actually happening of building up some companies, but they're really only small scale. And we need to go much further. So this is a study that was actually done by um, National Academy of Engineering out of the US and said we need a shift in innovation perspective. This was coming out of the US about three or four years ago um, from the data. It's a shift from making value, which is larger than making things. Okay, we're very good at making things in Australia. Give us a known problem and we can solve it. Our tyranny of distance and our innovation has constantly led us to that. That if we know what the constraints are, we can generally solve it. But when they become, you know, Donald Rumsfeld's quote, the unknown unknowns, it becomes a bit more difficult. And the current innovation strategies we use don't actually allow us to actually sometimes get to that root cause of it. So what they're referring to, um, making things is an important part, but making value requires this integrated system of understanding the customer, R&D, design, manufacturing, delivery of products and services. It's that collaboration, I think the people in this room can actually make that happen. So, I came up with this concept, design-led innovation, and it was really around this shift from technology-led innovation, what it started with. But where it came from, I did a lot of work with SMEs, a lot of work, um, and you'd ask the fundamental question, who's your customer? And they couldn't tell you. Or they'd say, when was the last time you actually had or listened to a customer about what problem you're trying to solve? Again, you'd ask them the senior management uh, board, you get five or six different answers. There was no consistency in it. And if you couldn't get that consistency of actually what their core problem was, it's very hard actually to actually innovate around. And you constantly see dilution within it. So this is some work that Euron did. We built upon it that in Australia, we've got lots of different types of innovation that can happen, from technology to efficiency offerings to business and models and improving effectiveness. In Australia, we're very good at this strong end, okay, doing technologies and efficiency. We've got the fundamentals. What we don't have is actually how we can actually build our capability here. This part of it is all about creating value. And if you look at Australia, we're very good at creating value around known problems. We're very poor at actually how you capture value along that um, value chain or around the business model. This is very different to value adding. It's about actually seeing your customer, not only actually just as your point of transaction, but across the entire spectrum within that. And to do that, you really need a deep insight of your customer. And these are some of the strategies you can do with it. This doesn't actually replace that, or sorry, this won't replace that. You need all of it to be successful. So my work is only a small part of a much larger. And then the work I'm doing at UTS recognizes that it's a capability that has to be built across all different parts of the stakeholder or value chain. So a, a small graph to kind of reiterate the same point. Australian industry, I would put very much down to this bottom right-hand qu uh, lower quadrant here. We're incremental thinkers in terms of our technology adoption, and we're very much good at or focus on functional requirements of customers. Again, we can take a brief and we can resolve it. If you move up this end to uh, disruptive technologies or some of the work that Sui was talking about, new product development can happen. And we have a fair few designers who can do technology diffusion. Likewise, we can actually move across this way. There's been a whole heap of work in user experiences. Um, a lot of banks do this. You know, we need to actually look at new services to actually deploy some of the new technologies, but fundamentally doesn't change a lot of the technology. What actually needs to happen is actually both. You need to get to this emotive level of your customer, and you need to actually really drive technologies. 
So that requires a shift in thinking, in management to actually think out a justice efficiency mindset, but it also then requires you to actually have this really deep understanding that drives new experiences and drives new technologies. It's a very different model. Those companies who have adopted it had had great success and are very clear in what they do. This is a quote that we were talking about that I want to use. And, and, and this comes from Ian Chubb and Jennifer Westacott. You know, what will the future be in their eyes that underpin a successful economy? You know, it starts with ensuring school students have the world's best literacy and numeracy, the STEM. Um, it's also about these soft skills like adaptability and design thinking. But the key is it's not either or, and they're not in separate uh, parts of an organisation. They're one and the same person that you need to actually start having. Now, we'll still need good designers as well. That, that's not replacing that. And I'm not trying to turn every business person or manager into a designer. All I'm saying is we need a different mindset, actually with some actually solid understanding of some fundamentals to move forward. So a lot of my work is actually bridging those two. Now, this was a very recent study that came out in March 2014 by the UK uh, government and it came out of the Community Innovation Surveys. It was over a 10 year period looking at the comparison between high growth firms and highly innovative firms. So two different metrics and high growth firms were actually sale, uh, firms that actually grew at the top 5% of um, sales and highly innovative firms were those who was investment in R&Ds and those who launched new products to the market. What they found was um, there was no relationship between high growth and highly innovative firms. And this kind of goes back to your work about actually picking winners. High growth firms are just episodic. Okay, they happen over a short period of time. Whereas highly innovative firms actually innovate over a long term and actually embed capabilities and focus on investing in people as part of their innovation rather than investing in new technologies. They also found this causal link between it starts with people, which then leads to new R&D, which then leads to new products, and then leads to sales. But most policy in the UK focuses actually on the sales end. And that actually removes an, uh, counterintuitive to actually saying we need actually better people inside our organisation. Okay, so there's a big gap in moving. So this is actually quite interesting to see that we've actually got uh, some very similar sort of data that are coming out of the UK. Um, so, but where does Australia sit inside this? So I was um, with um, my colleagues from CSIRO, Peter King, we were um, asked to do a study by the federal government to say, well, what is this word of design? What does it really mean for Australia? Where does it sit? <coughs> and this is a study, and it's, the study is about to be launched in, in, a, in a few weeks' time, we hope, where we interviewed 14 champions who demonstrate design-led capabilities. And these companies here range you know, across the nation. They're all manufacturing companies, whether they be in food, agri, TCF, um, consumer of some sort. And they're very large and small. All were highly successful in some, some way. And we interviewed these companies to find out, well, what were the salient features that we believe, looking at this through a design lens, and then we actually went back to about 300 odd um, manufacturers to actually co-design what this meant. And so the full study will be re released, which actually adopts some strategies. But we came up with this framework that this is what we believe some of the future skill sets is going to need to be. So the first one is this notion of clarity of purpose. Every single organisation had this clarity um, that communicated both internally and externally. And again, going back to a lot of the experience I had, most organisations actually can't tell me what their purpose is. And it sounds quite simple and sounds quite, quite obvious. But if you really strip back what that is, and I use this one example of a firm I work with, quite a successful firm, um, you know, making a particular sort of product, export winner, um, had 180 odd little projects going on. Very busy, very profitable. We went through a program where he said, well, what is my purpose? And he realised only four of them were actually be able to capture value across the value chain. So he killed 176 projects, which is quite a uh, leadership, you know, the brave decisions that are needed. Invested that money from those savings into four key projects and actually getting exponential growth in their organisation and through employment. 
But he needed that leadership skill to actually say, well, what's my clarity or purpose? Oh, they were, they were you know, cash flow positive. But were they actually looking at competitive? So here's some of the quotes that we see. You know, by central, uh, focusing on our, these are from CEOs, quotes that we actually used. Um, you know, when you get to this central why, this central purpose, your conversation gets really tight within your organisation. Staff know why they're there. They know what effort to be actually putting into projects. You know, this whole shift in culture is what you start to see. It's a very dynamic workplace. Um, you yeah, need to fill out, you know, what is the, what that core um, purpose around it, which means saying no to things. You know, how many companies are actually willing to say, I don't, it doesn't actually fit my purpose? Um, this whole notion that understanding that their business actually isn't an internal activity, it's an external, and getting everyone in an organisation to really understand who their customer is. Become your market was a key theme. Every one of them got out of the office and actually most of the staff got out of their offices and out of their labs. Okay, it wasn't about staying and innovating internally. It wasn't about hiding your ideas. It was actually about sh actively sharing your ideas and actually provoking your customers. And we saw that a lot. Um, so lots of data, you know, we, we hear a lot of stuff about big data. And big data is actually going to help uh, with innovation. Big data is in some respects, yes, that's true, but it's a lot of backward-looking data. How do you get to this forward-looking? How do you actually start to stimulate some of that thinking? And then what do you do with it? So SKUs in, in, in an uh, FMCG job uh, project tells you a lot about it. But we needed to actually know who they were and get everyone in the organisation to do that. Um, and getting everyone out of the office. I think that was key. The key um, for me is taking a CFO into a customer interview. Chief Financial Officer to say, well, this is actually your customer here. How, is that? How do you start to innovate around your financial reporting to actually meet their needs? Because it's not just innovation in R&D, it's innovation across the organisation. This notion of being the disruptor, and I suppose this is where design really comes into its own. Designers do actually like to actually um, put a vision of an alternative reality and do small experiments to get to that. And that constant means of actually disruption. And I use disruption as more of a, a risk mitigation strategy or governance. Try to disrupt yourself and then actually say, well, who could be your disruptor around that? And so lots of companies um, you know, all demonstrated this notion that they would actually go out and actively disrupt themselves. Not in a negative way, but to say, well, if we're not trying thinking about that, our competitors are. So how do we keep raising the bar here? Again, and how do we actually engage with our customers to actually help them disrupt us as well? Their needs change as much as our needs change. Yeah, moving away from this actually um, conservative nature. Fourth one, this is more like the middle stand, the German middle stand, or the micro multinational we get told a lot of. There's integrated business models. These companies are very clear on actually what um, their purpose is, what their focus is, and they actually have elements that are actually within that supply chain that they can control. Um, so they don't use design as just this one activity, they actually use it to design the actual business model. Designing the business model seems really counterintuitive, but it's no different to actually saying, well, if design is just a series of contradictions, a business model is just a series of activities, how you put them together around a common purpose and then actually prototype them is what they're doing. Um, you have to actually, you know, like this, you can't design to have a great product, you have to design it. You can't design to have a great company, you have to design it. When you get managers who've actually spoken like this, we can start to see some real champions inside Australia who are starting to use these tools. I think this last one was, you can't outsource this. Okay? It actually has to be an internal thing in the, in the first step. You have to own this change experience. And it has to have senior leader support, and then it actually has to work its way throughout the organisation. Um, and this is, I suppose, where it breaks down in Australia. We don't have that level of support to give to companies to engage like this. We have a really active design community, but it's not the designers who actually own this space. We have a very active science community. We have a very active business community. But what they're looking for is actually partnerships to challenge them and work with them. So I said, the final results of this report will come out shortly. But if I look at, you know, what are the future skill sets for manufacturing in 2030? 
for me, it's actually, it starts with empathy and, and really having companies who actually understand who their customer is and actually really get quite down detailed around that. It ends with disruption as a way of challenging an alternative view. It's underpinned by this collaboration, trust and learning. And at the moment, we've got a long way to go on that last bit there of actually making sure, and I think this, these sessions here, or the symposium, goes a long way to building that. And this is one of the last quotes that I use from a company. Again, a very successful RME, mining services company, um, Hall of Fame winner in export, and questioning himself and saying, well, brace yourself and rejig your brain for a level of open-mindedness. A very clever country, uh, company who is saying, yeah, we, we can actually challenge ourselves to remain competitive uh, with this. So that's pretty much for me. I might have gone a bit soon. Or, but I'm happy to have, I prefer questions. <laughs> Um, we've got time uh, for a few minutes worth of questions. So I'm doing some work at the Design Institute at the moment and I have a question around the representation of design yep. um, at senior level on boards, being included in a task force for manufacturing. Have you got any comment to make around that because I see given what you're doing at UTS, it should be applied to a much broader platform across governments. And, and I know the Australian Alliance, Design Alliance has been working towards a national design policy. But I was just thinking today, because we're at a skills um, council's um, event, if you've got any ideas about how we can integrate design into a much broader platform. Yeah, it's uh, a good question. Are there any designers in the room? One, oh good. So I can actually be. <laughs> um, so look, the, the, the challenge with design, even though design is seen as a very creative uh, process, it's actually very conservative as a discipline. Um, and, and design is actually a very um, used to working within their own field of um, uh, influence, I suppose. What needs to change is, I suppose, they need to apply these principles as much as anyone else. And they need to have better understanding of business. They need to have a better understanding of actually uh, policy making. Um, and again, a lot of them actually are quite happy with where their businesses are. Um, you know, that whole tsunami of actually impact. I heard the other day, coming out of um, China, there are currently three million design graduates uh, being in, in, um, about to, million a year about to come out. There were 15 universities giving design out, I think, 15 years ago, and now there's 250 universities of high quality. Um, so I think the designers you know, and their level of competitiveness needs to change. And I think they need to understand what their value proposition is. Um, and once we get that conversation happening, I don't think designers have an automatic right at the table, because they do bring a series of skill set. But without having these other fundamentals, um, it, it won't work, because it's not that part of collaboration. I don't know if that answered your question.